Hello, welcome to History and Lowell with me, Maritza Grooms, and my buddy, Bob Ferrant, professor at UML. Today we have a special guest, Mimi Parsegian. Hello. How are you? Good, good. Thank you for joining us today. My pleasure. So today we'll be talking about Armenian immigration into Lowell, right? Mm -hmm. And you are an Armenian American. Correct. Yes. So let's start from the beginning, right? Um, we're, we've talked about different groups coming in and, and what brought them here, when they came, and how their experience has been in Lowell. So wherever you'd like to start. Yeah, I, I think I have to give a little bit of history about Armenia because uh, we came from France. So people would say, you're, you're French. Oh, mm -hmm. no. Uh, my grandparents were uh, survivors of the Armenian Genocide. Mm -hmm. And uh, after they left their homeland, they went to Syria. Like most refugees, you, know, you travel. Uh, my, my mother's side, they went from Syria to Lebanon, then to France, to refugee camps in France. My father's side went from their homeland to Greece to Albania, back to Greece, and then again to Marseille, France, in another refugee camp, and my parents met there. And then we came here because my mother's family already had started to come. So we came to Lowell in 1963. And um, we came to Lowell because my cousin married a girl from Lowell. So we could, <laughs> if he had married a girl from Kansas City, would have gone to Kansas City. And I think that's That would have been Lowell's loss. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's true of a lot of immigrants, you know, especially uh, chain immigrants where you go where your family is. So this is how I, I came to Lowell in 63. And um, I lived uh, most of my adult life in Lowell. I, I've left, of course, to go to school, to go other places. But I consider myself a Lowellian. Oh, for sure. That's that's always what we come back to, yeah. anybody <laughs> who's come here. You're, you make up the fabric. Honorary or otherwise, right? <laughs> I'm still a blow-in, because yeah. I wasn't born here. but. <laughs> Oh, we're so lucky to have you, though. <laughs> Some people might think not, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's ridiculous. But, okay, so we talk a lot about refugees coming here, right? Um, and obviously, the Armenian Genocide was a great tragedy, um, as, as we see time and time again. Mm -hmm. And the long journey that you described coming, refugees, I don't think that people understand what it is to Correct. be a refugee. Um, and the kind of things that you have to face in order to even just get to a place where you can settle. Um, so why Lowell? Well, you said Lowell because of and, your family, uh, but. I think the question, why Armenians in Lowell? Yes, right, yes. Right. And uh, Lowell, like uh, for Armenians, like for a lot of for immigrants during that time, it was jobs. So all along, uh, the East Coast, when Armenians came by boat, they, they came into New York, Providence, and it was easier to stay along the East Coast. So you, you go all the way up from uh, you know New Jersey to Hartford to Providence, and all greater Boston, with in Lynn, with you know Watertown, where there was work that people could do. So Armenians came to Lowell. Actually, they started coming before the genocide, at the turn of the century, when the labor was needed. And like most immigrant groups, the men came first, started working, and then, you know, either brought their family if they had family or had their family fix them up with somebody, something like that, <laughs> and come here. <laughs> so at the turn of the century, there already was a community in Lowell. Uh, it, it, in a way, it was fortunate for the relatives of the Armenians who were suffering from the genocide that there was a community There's here. people here already. Yeah, mm -hmm. so they, they had a destination. They, you know, once they were able to be out of there, they had a destination. Again, it took a while to get here. Uh, Marseille was a, where, where I was born, was really uh, the place where a lot of Armenians came and left, came and left. They went through Marseille. The, when I was born in Marseille, there was like, I think 12 percent, 14 percent of the city was Armenian. I went to a school where half the people were Armenian. I was brought up in an Armenian ghetto like they were a lot. Um, so Lowell was well known, you know, uh, because there was jobs. And like a lot of other immigrant groups, people from the same area go to the same city. You mm -hmm. know, you know, all, you know, such and such person is, lives in Lowell, so they tell the kids, go to Lowell. If, you've, if your family went to Lawrence, they say go to Lawrence. So uh, the community was a little bit more, uh, maybe not everybody wasn't related, but culturally and geographically, they had already some ties. And uh, within 
I said within one generation, within one generation, they were able to to start establishing uh, a community where people bought homes instead of living in tenements. They bought homes. Uh, a lot of them started businesses. And then after they started their businesses, they bought some land, moved out of, moved out of the back Central Street where most of the Armenians came to. That was going to be my next yeah. question. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> most of the Armenians came to back Central Street, uh, moved out to other areas of the city, eventually moved out of Lowell. So uh, fast forward to today, uh, the Lowell population of Armenians is, is small, but the greater Lowell population is large. And most of these people, uh, when they say, you know, they still consider Lowell to be the hub of the, of the Armenian uh, community. I mean, people who live in Westford don't think it's Westford, no, they say it's Lowell. <laughs> Although, like I said, the population is, is small. Mm. You know, uh, like, like a lot of immigrants, I think, uh, the children do a little bit better than the parents. They go to school, they, they, and then they want a different kind of uh, lifestyle. Right. So when the, in the early 20th century, late 19th century, early 20th century, when the first Armenians are coming along, as you said, along the East Coast, um, actually from, I'm remembering from what you wrote in my class, <laughs> um, Lots of people. So Watertown was one of the places yes, that you already mentioned. That was a, that was one place where a lot of people. There was went. A, a huge wire company. Yeah. Say, yeah. And then there was another company here that was a company that did leather. I think mm -hmm. you correct. You said That's right. right. And that, see, I'm remembering. Wow, good <laughs> for me. Um, <laughs> and that the, a lot of people in Lowell got jobs in that particular factory too. So, so once people are here. Were religious and or cultural institutions started as well uh, back in the early 20th that's century? That's an excellent question. Uh, the church was not uh, built, it was on Lawrence Street, so mm -hmm. people could walk. It wasn't built till about uh, late 20s, it began early 30s. But they would have, uh, they would either rent a space or in their own home, they would s okay. celebrate and commemorate you know, the different holidays. Mm -hmm. It was not until the, the church was built where you had a community center where people could go mm -hmm. and do these things. So the building of the church, I think, was crucial for maintaining, the, putting the, keeping the community together. Because mm -hmm. how long can you go to somebody's house? As the community was growing, they did have Armenian classes in people's homes. Um, you know, they, they would have picnics or they would travel to other communities. Uh, but uh, it was not, and like again, I think it's not so much that I'm promoting the church, but the building itself, having a, a center, I always felt is very important for immigrants. Those immigrants who come to Lowell and have a, some place to go, I mm -hmm. think maintain their community much stronger than those don't, that don't have a building, whether they rent it or they own it. Right, the importance of maintaining cultural ties, knowing what's going on back home maybe, right. and, and just exchanging, mm -hmm. right? information socially and just being together that feeling of togetherness in a place where maybe um it's not necessarily your place but you're making it yours right, right. yeah and again i mean we see that dramatically in like across in the acre where you've got the greek church and the catholic church right across the canal from each other and you've got the french canadian catholic church just a couple blocks over and so it seems like that's again every Particular, every particular place people leave from has its own unique story, I think, in terms of what propels people to go, what war, famine, whatever it would be, genocide, you know, all the different stories, right, that cover all the people. And yet there are certain similarities when people I arrive. I think a lot of similarities. That, yeah, that they, it's, it's, it's fat, to me it's like a very interesting road map of like what makes people comfortable. Yeah. And you can definitely, you know, you can see that in all these different places in the city. Now, oh, uh, yeah, yeah, so <laughs> in the 60s, when the population was pretty large in Lowell, uh, a, a building was bought on Liberty Street, and that became a cultural center for some of the Armenians, not all of it. I'm not going to go into the history of, of internal issues of Armenians, <laughs> because <laughs> I no, think that's can't be. <laughs> it's the same thing we see <laughs> in so many other ethnic yep. groups. Right, so, I, mean, right. yeah, I took the, last year, two years ago, I took the, one of uh, Dick Howe's walks, what's called Greek town, and, they, and the person explained why there's four Greek churches, or there were four Greek churches. So same, I mean, it's mm -hmm. it repeats, history <laughs> repeats itself with every group. <laughs> so on Liberty Street, uh, 
that's where the center was. And, and it stayed that way. And you know, people who had moved out would bring their children and grandchildren there because, again, to celebrate Armenian Christmas or to celebrate Lenten dinner or to, uh, or to commemorate events, you need a center. And uh, I know I'm probably repeating myself, but if any immigrant group is, wants to maintain some kind of, of existence, getting, getting your own place is important. It's uh, extremely important for the culture and for and the, for the people coming. Um, do you think, because we've seen this with other cultural groups, when the second and third generations start becoming a part of the community, uh, is there a little bit re of resistance in um, being a part of yes, their own culture? Yes, uh, there is. But there's such a compelling story about being Armenian. Uh, you know, we, we've been around forever. You know, there's a homeland, there's, uh, it's interesting. So uh, often what we see is those who marry non-Armenians, the non-Armenian becomes a little bit more attractive because there's, there's something of a major substance there. And um, so, yes, but that, that occurs, you know, people want to go away and then they come back. Mm -hmm. I, I see that the older you get, the more you want some kind of identity with people. And so mm -hmm. those who have, who have done other things at some point in their life, I think, stop and reflect and say, who am I and where have I come from? Or maybe, I, w I wish I would have participated more when my mom yeah. was trying to make me. Correct, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah, I mean, in my, in my um, I'm teaching immigration history to undergrads this semester, and I gave them all an assignment that they had to go and talk to um, their grandmothers and grandfathers, or if there was a great-grandmother or, great, you know, somebody as far back as they would could go and then they were going to come to class and tell the story of how they all ended up here and it was really funny because when I gave the assignment they were all groaning and mumbling oh what are I going to do you know <laughs> and then after they came in and did it they all thanked me because for a lot of them they heard stories they had never heard before because they never bothered to ask mm -hmm. and it was the same in my family which is from Quebec and Ireland and Italy unless you asked they didn't necessarily volunteer if it was a struggle if they came you know, and they were really poor when they got here and it was hard to carve out a life, they're not necessarily going to tell That's you right. that if you don't ask, right? right? right and so right. they, are, so almost to a person, they said, this was, thank you so much for doing this. Yeah. But they also all said, my mother thought I was weird when I started asking her about <laughs> where we came from. <laughs> <laughs> so, all again, sudden, it was like, it, yeah, it's <laughs> yeah. like a really, uh, it's a, interesting sort of byplay, right, between the generations to try to... Especially uh, people who come out of trauma, the first generation, mm -hmm. you're right, they never volunteered anything, right. almost as if they, they wanted to leave that behind, as if, you know. And the second generation was trying just to figure out who they are in this new land, you know, the parents uh, don't speak English. or the, So, so it's, it became the third generation that became really the ones that said, wait a second, what's going on here, mm -hmm. you know? And, but it takes three they generations. They could be the ones to do the family tree, right? Yeah, they're right. the ones who started becoming <laughs> vocal, you know, and, 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 and asking for, what, why did, what was this done for, uh, to us? Why is no one punished? No. Mm. So it takes a couple of generations when you come out of trauma like right, this. Right, yeah. yeah. And then, oh, go ahead. No, no, go no. ahead, keep going. Okay. I was going to just say that we've seen it even in, um, I'm thinking like the Cambodian yes, culture. Right. I remember I went to a play at MRT that described exactly that. They were maybe second or third generation um, and their parents had come from the Khmer Rouge and the mother didn't want to talk about being a refugee. and. They and, and I did. I think they did a really great way of um, showing how kids become a part of the American culture and they they resist their own mm -hmm. culture a little bit. But then when things happen in the family, they want to know more about that trauma and why their parents are the way they are, or why they emphasize things like the importance of getting an education or you know being the best that you could be because this is where we came from. And yeah, when, when the you stop having. A immigrant mentality, you know, that uh, I'm a farmer in this land, when you say, well, this is my land too, then you, I think you can go and start figuring out who you are and where you came mm -hmm. from and, you know. Um, but I have to say, when I came to Lowell in 63, uh, there was no ESL, none of this stuff, but it was such a welcoming community for an immigrant. It was, uh, the teachers couldn't have been nicer, the, you know, the fellow students, the neighbors. I. I I don't know what has happened. I'm not saying Lowell's not a welcome community. On the contrary, we're, we're unique in that sense. But I don't see it out there. I mean, when I remember when I came, and people couldn't have been nicer. You know, I couldn't speak English. They, they, everybody was trying to be helpful. Um, you know, it's just 
oh, look, like somebody from another country. Wow, yeah. I think that's a unique characteristic of Armenian immigrants because I think historically we've seen that those groups who come in, and maybe because you've already had kind of a presence here, mm -hmm. it was different because other groups faced extreme prejudice and discrimination um, and then became those groups that also dealt with. I think I came into <laughs> my time as immigrants. I think immigrants, people saw immigrants as, as ref you know, revitalizing the community, mm -hmm. you know, something uh, interesting to people. Now, of course, a lot has changed. I mean, in, in the early 60s, you're coming right at the moment where um, this is when President John F. Kennedy has articulated that he wants to change all the restrictions right. on immigration. He wants to get rid of the immigration quotas put in place in 1924, which we've talked about right. here before. And so he's become a champion, in a way, of sort of opening the country up. It's also connected, in a way, to the to the history of the Cold War and the United States and the in the rest of the world has sort of a black eye in that there there are all these civil rights issues in the country and as well the Soviet Union is going around saying to different countries in the world don't think they're your friend look what happens to you know they don't even want to let people in from China or Asian countries or India or anywhere else and so for foreign policy and other reasons the country opens up but when you came so in the, in the early 60s when you came, you would have had help, and I know this partly because I ha I've mm -hmm. seen the photo of your sister um, standing in front of the International Institute as a, as, mm -hmm. as a young girl. So the International Institute helped mm -hmm. you to Correct. sort of right. become acclimated Correct. to all. It was not only language, but they would teach you cultural things. Because I, as a lot of immigrants would say, it's just not the language, but like cultural references that you don't know anything about. Mm. Uh, you know, uh, Thanksgiving, I mean, what is Thanksgiving about? You know, the food you've never seen. I think for a child, an immigrant child, that's just as important as the language. Not, or they'll make reference to a television show, uh, mm. you know, uh, or something they read when they were in second grade, which you did not read. Mm. So mm. I, the International Institute at the time um, was not only helpful with the language, but more, for me, more with the cultural things. There were a lot of, everybody was an immigrant in the group, so you know, from different countries, Portugal, uh, Puerto Rico. I know at least those, a lot of Portuguese. So it was, it was kind of, it was comfortable. Not that my classmates did not make me feel comfortable, but this was a little bit more comfortable. Well, you shared a commonality of mm -hmm. being different, right? Right, right. What's, what's one thing that, if you, can, if you can remember, that was kind of culturally shocking for you coming here? I, I, ha I came from France, southern France, where the cuisine is outstanding. <laughs> it was the food. <laughs> it's, it all has changed. It has changed drastically. American cuisine is excellent. The wines are excellent. <laughs> no, but when we came, it was a little bit shocking, yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. Uh, I think I know some kids who still and you complain could, about that. <laughs> you could not bring your own food to lunch, which people say, what is this? You know? Yeah. So, but that. F from a kid's point of view, that was probably the most shocking thing. Absolutely, I had a friend who said that too, um, and I believe she's Japanese American. But she went. She remember she was telling me a story about being one of the few people of color in her school and bringing her lunch that was from her culture mm -hmm. and being very ashamed to eat it because everybody was like, "What is that? Why do you have like something like what like seaweed or something? Mm -hmm. Right? Like it's like this is unheard of." <laughs> mm -hmm. Probably had a different smell. Exactly. All kinds of things that would sort of like make everybody look right. Mm -hmm. And television. Was was also shocking that you had all these stations and you had all these kinds of programs. It's shocking in a good way because it was great. It was all entertainment, a lot of entertainment. So, but it, again, from a kid's point of view, right? Uh, that must have been wow. I can't even again. I can't even imagine that because well, I grew up here, right? But yeah, I mean, a lot of people um, when when we've done oral histories with people, one of the things m that a lot of people comment on is they think. And so this is even more recent, like say 80s and 90s, um, and even now, say in the last 10 years, people have the, a lot of newcomers have the impression that everybody in America is rich, <laughs> right? Because what you see, if you see any TV yeah. or what you see if you see a movie, there's hardly ever anything about like working class people or, pe you know, you don't. There's not like that representation on TV or whatever. And so one of the things that 
that students have always said to me when I ask them that same question you just asked, like what surprised you? That will usually be one, <laughs> that, that there is such a disparity in mm. standards of living and housing and so the differences between like riding around low and seeing housing and then, you know, riding to Andover mm. or something like that or just like wait, you know, or going up into New Hampshire and seeing like just trees and lakes and like around here you just see buildings, right? That those disparities are not things they come prepared to understand. The picture, I, I was, a k when I was a little younger than, I came, I was 10 years old when we came, but when I was younger people would talk about America, adults, and they would all say, you know, money grows on trees in French mm. that. <laughs> and I literally thought that you, I was going to come to the United States and pull dollars off the trees. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but it's, but you're right. Um, you, you have that Hollywood image, and uh, now, now, you, now things have changed because the world has become much smaller. But those days, you, everything was Hollywood. You know, these beautiful oh, colors. Yeah. You know, and then the women were beautiful. The men were handsome. You know, so you're right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it's funny because money. The there were a lot of posters back in the early 20th century in port cities where people would be leaving that would show America and. The, the image would be a tree with money hanging off of it, <laughs> right? But I can, I mean, one of my mother's favorite expressions always when we asked for something was, you think money grows on trees? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so she's the daughter of um, Italian immigrants, right? And so that's her expression back to me as the next generation, you think money grows on trees? <laughs> um, and so it is funny to hear when people come sort of with that. But you know, th there is, people come here because there is more opportunity. Mm -hmm. And sp especially the, when we came, that that was the era where people really came to, to have a better life. And uh, again, you know, um, coming to Lowell, there was still a lot of jobs. Lowell had, you know, the manufacturing was still very active. Mm -hmm. So you could be, uh, you know, untrained or whatever, you could be, you know, uh, and find a job. It's not the case anymore because the economy has changed. But those days, People wanted immigrants to come because they had still had a lot of jobs. So maybe that's part of the whole, the whole issue we have now. But I, um, I, I, I always consider myself lucky and fortunate that we came here. I said, how lucky was it that we came here, as opposed to somewhere else? So in the photograph that, that from the institute mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. has your sister in it, there's another Armenian. Boy, boy with yes. her, right? Uh -huh. And when we emailed back mm -hmm. and forth about the photograph, um, you said his family went back to France. So was that something that was maybe not typical, but something that did happen? Yes, it, it, it wasn't typical, but it did happen. Uh, primarily, it, you know, if you come here and your family's still there, okay. mm -hmm. like the, the mother's family was still there. So after a while, it's it, it becomes difficult. Or, you know, uh, yeah, you're working, but, you know, you're not rolling in dough. You know, things are okay. They're not great. Mm -hmm. uh, so y your future doesn't seem, f doesn't seem as great as you thought it was going to be. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you say, well, d do I want to stay here without my family, or do I want to go back and take another chance? So there were people who went back. Uh, a lot of people left Lowell, went to California a lot. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. that's where a lot of the Armenians had gone. But it was like, uh, let's see if this works out better for me. That kind of thing. Um, but still staying in the U.S. It's still, yeah. But it was, okay, this is not working for me for whatever reason. I need to be near more Armenians or I need to be uh, in a warmer place. Yeah, away I from came the cold. From, right? <laughs> right, <laughs> I came from a warmer place. I can't stand it here. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 if California was not there, would these people go back? Perhaps some would go back to somewhere else that they came from. Um, also, what happened to Armenians uh, as the as the Middle East was was going through uh, the turmoil in the sixties and seventies and eighties, a lot of Armenians after they left the homeland, like my grandparents went to uh, Syria and then to uh, Lebanon, but a lot of them stayed there. You know, the, the Syrian people were very welcoming, so it wasn't the Lebanese people, and they were they were going through their own changes. You know, the end of the mm -hmm. Ottoman Empire, the establishment of the countries. But when the turmoil began in the Middle East, really began with Egypt at the turn of the century. Armenians left Egypt. 
a lot of them did not come here. A lot of them went to Canada. But mm. after Canada, some came here. The biggest, biggest wave that came was uh, when the Lebanese Civil War began. Mm. So a lot of Armenians who had relatives, mm -hmm. they would, no, second, even second cousins, they would bring them here. The great majority that came from Lebanon, Iran, uh, and later Syria. So this would have been in the 70s and 80s? 80s, I did not stay in Lowell. They came to Lowell uh, and you know, because the family was here, perhaps stayed a year, a year and a half to get their, their feet on the ground and they moved to California. So Lowell mm -hmm. did not have that uh, renaissance of Armenians like Watertown had. Mm -hmm. A lot of them stayed in Watertown. Providence had, uh, and then, but the majority, or Detroit or Chicago, but the majority that came to Lowell Actually, I probably all went to California. So again, it was not helpful to c maintain the community because the, they went, again, to California where I think there's more Armenians in California than in Armenia, I'm not sure. But <laughs> you know, the weather, the opportunities, the culture, it's a, it's a great state for immigrants. Uh, so they left. Mm. And people could have come in the 1970s and 80s initially to Lowell because having a population here with changes in the immigration laws from from 1965, mm -hmm. family reunification right, was right. That's place. What, that's so why they came here. If you were here, you could bring your grandmother and your grandfather or, you, you know, like close, not, mm -hmm. not like eighth, eighth cousin removed or something like that, but you could definitely bring a pretty large segment of your family if you wanted to. Right, that's exactly what they did. Uh, these people also came with a little bit of, of, of resources because they already mm -hmm. had been living in wherever country for couples uh, generation. So the moment they, they got a feel for the, for the lay of the land, they, 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 no, California, here I come. <laughs> <laughs> That's what my daughter said when she graduated. <laughs> <laughs> California, here I come. See you later, Dad. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I think it's really great that we have, even though it's a smaller population of Armenians, I know a few who are around my age who are still s so proud of their culture. And I think it, it really speaks to that um, that cultural maintenance, right, and and Lowell being such a welcoming place to have that, to be able to create those spaces and to continue to integrate people into the community while still being able mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. be proud of where they've come from. Uh, Lowell's, uh, I have to say before we finish up, the Lowell government, the uh, Lowell people were extremely welcoming. The city gave us a piece of a piece of land next to City Hall at City Hall where the monuments are. And uh, in 2015, on the, the 100th anniversary of the of the genocide, we were able to pull a monument. But you know, th this is the kind of city we live in, so it was very nice. Right. I, I think it's so great too, just to hear hear such a positive, um, a, a positive light from from the past with Lowell and immigrants. Um, even though we have been a welcoming place for a while. Um, and it, it is welcoming week right now, right? Oh, yes. so, <laughs> oh, so I'm, I'm really glad to have you on the show mm -hmm. today to be able to speak to how welcoming Lowell has been for you and the success that you found here. Um, and you know, all of, the, all of the wonderful Armenians who make up the great community of Lowell um, and that we could be that for everyone here. So thank you for coming thank on you the for show today. Me. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Thanks. <laughs> and thank you all for tuning in to History and Lowell.